Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. This time on Voice of the Sea, we spend the day at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's SOEST Open House. SOEST is the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, and every two years they open their laboratories and workspaces to school groups and the general public. I talked to SOEST researchers who shared their knowledge of earthquakes, volcanoes, waves, and the sounds of the sea. Okay, well, we're one of 122 forecast offices around the country, all right? Uh, our office is unique in several different ways. One of the main ways is where we're standing right now. We're on a college campus and we're inside a university building. You don't see that very often. There's probably four, maybe five of those 122 offices where that actually happens. Typically, we're in a standalone building or in the terminal of an airport, at a major airport, okay? When this office first started, it was out in the terminal building at H&L here in Honolulu, um, and then they moved it out because of space issues, and now we have our current location. The University uh, Meteorology Department is right upstairs, so that's kind of the idea of having us here is we can team up with them, we work with them on different projects and various things. A lot of the people here are graduates of the University of Hawaii as well, okay, so it's kind of a unique. We also have other unique uh, responsibilities that we'll talk about a little bit later on about what our office does. So I moved here from Maine. And uh, people go, whoa, hey, right? So I was up in Caribou where they get 116 inches of snow a year. <laughs> I came to the tropics. Um, I love it. And I came for just for, well, that was one of the main purposes. I just love it out here, okay? Um, and uh, so people up there were like, oh, you're moving to Hawaii. The weather's so quiet. It's so easy, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, well, it's a lot different than that. Not only is the weather interesting and not necessarily quiet here on the islands, uh, but our responsibilities at this office take us far beyond the state. And we'll talk more about that. We, we kind of see a very large area that we forecast for, which makes us very unique. So let's get on through the tour. Um, there, it'll be a little bit quicker than a normal tour. Sometimes they can be a little bit longer. But we're going to go through right into our operations area and show you all the good stuff. So come on with me down the hallway. This is our admin area here. My little hole, I could, or an office as they call it over there. We'll come on in here. I'll just have everybody kind of pile out in front of these TVs, okay? I'm going to be kind of running back and forth here. but Okay, so everybody kind of pile in. Can everybody see these TV monitors? Right? Okay. Now I want everybody to pivot and look the other way. Okay, so that's our operations area. And I'm going to wander around and we'll talk about what you're seeing here, okay? And I, I'm going to wiggle a couple of mouse mice so that uh, it looks more interesting. Okay, we got some things on the monitors. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so this is our operations area, okay? This is, if you could think of the National Weather Service office like a human body, okay? This is both the beating heart and the brains of the operation, okay? That was a compliment, guys. You got it? Okay, very good. good. Okay, so this is where all the work gets done, okay? This, and there's also another station around the corner where Larissa is working on data gathering and other projects over there as well, all very important. We have at least four to five people on staff 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Okay, we've got people that have come from uh, all over the United States, uh, some local people from Hawaii here, other people from the mainland as well, kind of very unique perspectives as we go through. Okay, each of these desks has a very specific purpose on a typical day. However, each of these forecasters can do everything that's on all these various desks, okay? And we're here, like I said, 24 hours a day. If you want to call at 2.15 in the morning, Chris will happily answer your call, okay? So Chris is now working on what we call the public desk, and this is a desk that forecasts all the public weather for the state of Hawaii, okay? And so we're talking the, how many clouds are going to be? Is it going to be partly cloudy? Is it going to be mostly sunny? Uh, how strong the winds are going to be? What direction they're going to be coming from? What chance of precipitation there is? What type of precipitation it might be? Um, are we expecting any flooding, any strong winds, any of the active weather as well? All that's done from this desk primarily, a very Im important desk here. In the back left here is our, is our aviation desk. Our aviation coverage, we cover about 10 million, 9, 10 million square miles of the Central Pacific from here to the Philippines. For any flights that are flying through that area, we let them know about significant issues that may be dealing with uh, volcanic ash, thunderstorms, 
tropical cyclones, turbulence, and other hazardous weather, okay? So that's something very unique to our office. On the mainland, they have the Aviation Weather Center in Kansas City that does that for the country and its own specific office. Here we blend it into our operational structure and have forecasters doing that at various times. So that's a very unique perspective from our, from our side. Um, we also do terminal forecasts for all the major airports in the state and all the various islands at Midway and some other locations as well, um, where we forecast wind speed, wind direction, cloud height, visibility, how many clouds are going to be in types of weather for all the airports. And these are very important forecasts that go into uh, planners for the aviation industry, planning on how much fuel they take in their planes, any backup flight plans of where the alternative landing zones might be. Okay? All that is, much of that is based on our forecasts. So if we mess up a forecast, they could, they could put too much fuel in, spend a couple extra million dollars, which may affect ticket prices, which, you're right, all these different things happen. So there's a lot of big responsibility and then the aviation desk. Uh, some of the offices in, uh, say, like New York, in D.C., they have extra personnel just to handle the aviation weather because all the flights that are coming through those areas, okay? All right, back over there, Bob is working on the Marine Desk. The Marine Desk handles a 15 million square mile area of the Central and South Pacific, dealing with wind and wave forecasts. We also do streamline analysis, talking about kind of the general wind flow pattern over that part of the world, okay? Very important as well. Uh, we do the surf zone forecast. Anybody a surfer? Anybody like call themselves a surfer like me, but they're not really a surfer. Okay, there's probably a few of us out there. We kind of dabble in it, trying to get hurt or killed when I do it. Um, uh, that's done from this desk as well. Currently we do it for Oahu and with plans to expand it to all the different islands as well. So uh, that's, that's kind of a neat thing coming down the road. Okay, um, and also Derek is working on the satellite desk. That desk does a lot of uh, satellite interpretation. That's why we call it the satellite desk. They also do typically help out with the marine forecast for wind, uh, waves, and a swell forecast for the near shore environment around the state as well. So if you're taking your boat out and you get your wave forecast of four to six foot seas and, and lots of puking over the side of the deck, that comes from Derek, okay? If we have... Satellite data? Uh, that, well, the waves, not usually. The wave data will come from uh, just uh, buoy data that we get from around the state and other parts of the Pacific. But so the satellite does that, does the waves and the satellite. The satellite interpretation, there's some products that we issue out that's used by the aviation industry and others. Um, some products that may not be used by anyone, we're still working out whether they're important or not. Uh, but one of the main things that this desk does is if we have a tropical cyclone over the, over the Pacific. We don't typically get a Hurricane Hunter aircraft to fly into those storms unless it's directly threatening the state and we expect a, a pretty large impact. Okay. The hurricane hunters are stored in Mississippi and Florida. So how often do you think they get out here? Almost never. Okay. And if they come out this way, there's so little land, they can't spend a lot of time flying through the storm because they get to fly a thousand miles to land back on Hawaii, right? Just one way. And so when they fly in the Caribbean and the Atlantic, they have more land. So they can fly from Florida, fly through the storm four or five times and land on some tropical paradise island in the Caribbean. The pilots spend a wonderful evening and they get back on the plane and do it again the next day. Okay? Here, they'll be flying extra thousands of miles. It makes it a little bit hard. So it only happens in kind of those specialized circumstances. So the moral of that story is that people, folks on this desk will actually interpret, interpret that satellite data to f pinpoint the center of where the storm is, just using the satellite. Okay? And then using uh, a system to, of analysis to analyze how strong that storm is, how strong the winds are just from the satellite data called the VORAC, okay? And so they're using that to estimate wind speed because we don't have any data out there. Unless a ship happens to pass through it, which we don't want to have happen anyways, we do get OBS from some of the moving, moving ships like that or it goes over a buoy, okay? Otherwise it would be either in a buoy that has a weather instrument on it or on a ship. We've got several, many ships that are around the world that take weather observations and then they send it to us and so we can kind of track them as they go on. But as you can imagine, there's a lot more ocean than there are ships and so those, those data points are kind of, you know, few and far between most of the time. As we're going to start out in the top right screen here, okay, what this screen is showing you is called visible satellite imagery. So we have a satellite up over the earth and we've zoomed in here, in particular over the state of Hawaii. Um, but you can see at the beginning, it's kind of dark, right? And then it lightens up. So this imagery is only available when the sun is up. That's what we call visible satellite imagery. So it's just showing you where the clouds are right now, and you see it there, okay? And there is a color scale in there. So we lose some, like, the color of the ocean. You don't see any of that stuff, but it just focuses on the clouds. Complete. Like, oh, it's like one of the, the 
like a zoomed in area with one of the GOES satellites, or is it yes. another special device? Yeah, this is GOES, yep. Yeah. So zoomed in. And we could program different locations, um, so we could focus on a storm or the state or islands, we can kind of move it around. Now I want to ask you guys, I want you to make a weather forecast for today. You've been out there, so it's pretty nice, right? But I want you to forecast for the rest of today what the weather is going to be just based on the satellite. So I want you to look here. So here we are in Oahu, right? Sure. Now you look off to the east. See how the clouds are moving from east to west? Yeah. So you can pretty much see that this area here is heading straight towards us. Okay, so what do you notice about this area? A little cloudy. It's blank, right? Pretty clear. Okay, you guys agree over there? Okay, it's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll talk more of that over there. So yeah, there's the, all sorts of different things going on. But this, the low-level clouds here are east to west moving toward us, and they're pretty clear. So we can deduce a couple of things, right? There's lots of sunshine upstream, and there's lots of dry air. Okay. One thing out over the Pacific, there's lots of moisture around. But there are air pockets where it's drier or wetter than other spots. Okay. And it really stands out. If there's moisture out there, you're going to see clouds and, and pockets of showers. If it's dry, you'll end up seeing a lot of dry air. Okay, so we can pretty much deduce that if we see this here upstream, that the rest of today into tonight is going to be really, really nice. You will see kind of the typical windward and Malka, maybe some showers, especially when we get towards the evening. Okay, maybe a stray that sneaks over. I mean, it even looks like here over the Waianae, there may be some clouds popping there too. So maybe there's enough moisture, we'll sneak a shower out over the leeward side of Oahu as well. Um, upstream of the big island, a few more clouds and some showers moving in towards windward portions of the island. And then see how the clouds here? start popping up. Okay, everybody been over to Kona? Starts out nice and all of a sudden the clouds start building up over the mountain and then they drift down in the evening and you get some showers and maybe some wind and other things. Okay, so it started out nice. Clouds are starting to build up here as well. It's pretty dry out there so you're probably not going to see a lot today. Probably just more clouds more than anything. Maybe a stray shower. Uh, but the peaks, okay, Mauna Loa, it's a big clear spot. So if you're up on the summit, you're looking down, you'll see some clouds forming, but you're sitting up in the dry air, okay? That's pretty unique. Now, you guys are mentioning the different directions the clouds are going. You notice that. Let's go over to this satellite imager here. I'm going to actually pivot over here. You can, you can move up here if you'd like. I don't want uh -oh. to block your view. Make sure you can see that. <laughs> kind of angle myself here. So this is what we call infrared imagery. And this actually is, isn't looking just straight at the surface of the Earth. What it's actually looking for is radiation being emitted in a certain spectrum and wavelength from water vapor. And we're able to use that wavelength of energy to estimate fairly accurately the temperature of the clouds that you're seeing. In this case, it's the opposite of what you normally would think. The hotter colors, the reds and oranges, are actually colder temperatures. And they're colder temperatures because these clouds are higher up in the atmosphere. Okay, there's a reason why when you're flying in the plane, they seal it because, and the air, the air is so dry because they're pulling in very dry and cold air and then heating it up to make it comfortable and it gets even more dry. Okay? But the air outside the plane is very, very cold. And that's what you're seeing here. These are some groups of thunderstorms well down to our south, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, um, showing us where they're popping up. Further up to our north, there's an area of low pressure up over the north central Pacific that's rotating counterclockwise and the clouds are moving from southwest to northeast. Okay. As you get closer to the surface in the warmer clouds here, which are these gray clouds, okay, you guys notice that they're all moving from east to west? Okay, all these low clouds. There's high pressure to our north and the east that moves in a clockwise fashion, and the winds blow these clouds from east to west in our trade wind pattern. This is a very typical kind of trade wind. So what we're getting here is the trade wind flow down near the surface of the earth, and then the upper level flow coming in the direction. Okay, kind of a nifty, nifty deal. And this trade wind pattern happens, you know, eight to nine out of every ten days during the year. Okay, especially in the summertime, it's almost constant. Okay, uh, the winter time that flow breaks up and we get some shifts to the south, we bring in some bog, it gets humid, right? Some heavy rain for leeward areas. Most of the time, that trade wind flow keeps going. Now let's shift out of this monitor. Talk about another thing that we do. So we do those wind, those wave forecasts I talked about, right? So. All the big surfers out there, they talk about swell, right? They want to know where the swell is. There's a couple different things that go on. When storms form and the wind is blowing, it blows the surface of the ocean, okay? If a storm sets up in a similar area, we call it a fetch, and the winds blow in the same direction for hours and hours and hours, maybe a day or more, okay, or longer, over the same stretch of ocean, 
then that surface of the ocean gets a lot of energy. You get big waves, okay? These waves will move on out, okay? Because waves and ocean, the energy is conserved, so they don't just disappear, right? They just pretty much go. They lose a little bit of energy, then they hit whatever they hit, okay? And then they dissipate or reflect, okay? So these waves are going out. That storm system moves away, but after it moves away, those waves are still moving, okay? As they move out in the open ocean, over time, they kind of blend together. So instead of being individual waves on the surface of the ocean, they kind of morph together into big, long waves that get shallower in the open ocean. Sometimes they can be really big. A lot of times they get pretty shallow, but they're longer waves, okay? So waves have a couple different things. They have height, and they also have something we call a period, okay? So when you stand at the beach and a wave hits you, the time between that time when that wave hits you and the next wave that hits you, that's called the wave period. It's the length of the wave, okay? How much time it takes for one wave to pass through an area. So wind waves are usually pretty small. When the wind's blowing out on the east shores, when the trades are going, right, you're at Makapu, right? And those waves are just kind of washing all over the place. Pretty short period, maybe a couple of seconds, five, six seconds, those waves are coming through, okay? When you get these open ocean waves, they can get up to 10, 15, 20, 25 seconds in between waves, okay? The longer the period, time between waves, the stronger those waves are, okay? So what this is is a model showing wave period over time for about the next week. And here we are. If you watch at the beginning, there's this wedge of green and yellow right there, okay? That is a northwest swell from that low pressure to our north that I was talking about, okay? That's swinging its way in, and we get periods of 15, 16, 17 seconds out of that. And it's starting, it looks like later this weekend into early next week. So what that means is on the north shore, the surf's gonna be up, okay? We have a northwest swell that came from a storm in the North Pacific that's gonna swing its way through. And then as we go out in time, that swell works its way down to the south, and then a dominant, larger swell starts to come in from the south. So this looks like where this is a week out, the swell is about here. You see it kind of spray out from that direction. So there's some big storms over the south hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and it's sending up that energy. You're talking um, periods that are getting closer to 20 seconds, so they're a little bit more energy waves. But you see how they kind of, the model shows it breaking up? It hits these island groups, and some of the waves get dissipated, they wash out, so they'll get big waves into Haiti and Fiji and other areas, and then the energy will kind of squeak through and then work its way towards us. So there could be another week and a half, plus maybe, a, maybe some swell coming from the south, okay? But that's kind of a ways out there, so we'll have to stay tuned to that. But the more certain thing is we're gonna get some waves from the northwest, okay? Kind of neat. And you can see waves come all, from all different directions here in Hawaii, right? We're like this pin stuck in the middle of the ocean and all the storms from all the different angles send in waves. So last week we had some strong easterly waves because there was an area of low pressure pumping in waves from the east. So the east shores, we had a high surf advisory up for them. Now it's going to be the north shore and then maybe the south shore after that. So that's why you see a lot of people with surfboards here because we get it from all over. Okay, it comes from all over. The white yeah. lines, are those like straight circles? Or something? Yes, that's exactly right. Yep, straight circle lines. Okay. Can the wind just change direction randomly? Not usually randomly. Those, you'll come around on the other one. Yeah, it kind of wraps all the, the way around. The circles will go around, all around the earth. So good question. <clears throat> Winds don't necessarily just change randomly. Okay, it may seem like it, yeah. but there are things going on in the atmosphere that change the wind direction. Winds try to go from high pressure to low pressure. Okay, think of a balloon, right? When you blow a balloon up, all your air gets forced inside this little balloon, right? and it, it's kind of hard. And what does that air want to do? Out. It wants to go out. Because outside of the balloon, it's low pressure. There's nothing holding it back. But inside the balloon, oh boy, it wants to, it's stuck. It's under high pressure. So once you open up, it blows right out, okay? The atmosphere works the same way. So when you have an area of low pressure moving around, it draws wind towards it, okay? And then you have high pressure that pushes air away. And so they kind of work together. That's on a big scale, but then you come down into like next to buildings or near the ocean or near a mountain and the heating of the earth, the color of objects, how many trees there are versus beach or how steep the mountain is changes pressure all around you and it can change the wind direction at all times. Okay? I used to always joke when I ride my bike, I ride a bike a lot, that the wind always changes to be blowing in my face. <laughs> you ever notice that? Yeah, yeah. So it must, maybe I'm low pressure and this sucks to it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it always happens. Is that so. why low pressure is associated with cloudy bad weather? Because everything just sort of 
it gets it gets that. drawn in and then the air kind of piles up and as it piles up it lifts and you get clouds and showers. So the low pressure happens first, then the storms, or the storms happen first, then the low pressure? Low pressure will happen first. Okay. So thunderstorms are caused from low pressure? Yes. Yeah, locally. Thunderstorms are a little unique too that they, they're kind of like a heat pump I call it. So it gets real hot at the ground and then it's colder up above. And the thunderstorm is that the atmosphere's way to suck that heat chuck it up into the air where it's colder and mix the atmosphere around. Because the atmosphere all around the globe would want to be the same temperature all the time. If it could have it, it would be the same. But it's not, right? Because the Earth is curved, we get ocean, we get land, we get poles, we get all sorts of sun angles and things. So it heats differently, so the atmosphere tries to move it around. So it takes hot air from the poles and moves them, from the, excuse me, from the equator, moves it north, cold air from the poles, moves it south. At the same time, it's rising, moving warm air up, moving cold air down, and all kind of mixes it around. So a thunderstorm is like a real small version of that. Okay? Pretty wild. Pretty wild. So what makes the low pressure in the first place just what you said, or is it, I mean? If they, the, 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 mainly the differential heating of the Earth. Based okay? on, the, on the surface? Yes. So low pressure systems can be generated thermally, right? So if you look at a, a weather map over the southwestern U.S. in the heat of the summer, Okay. If you look over Arizona and Eastern California, there'll be this big fat red L on the weather map. Because okay. it's so hot, there's so much rising air that it creates an area of low pressure. Okay. And so those, all those various differences, that whether it's over land or the, the various heating over the ocean, start to migrate around. And as they mix back together, it can cause the pressure to rise or fall and then create fronts and all sorts of... That's a kind of a simplistic way to talk about it, but it really... So, so over the, the ocean, do you get, how do you get a low pressure? I mean, because the, the ocean's going to be more homogeneous. I would think. Yeah, well, it's, the ocean itself is, has different temperatures, right? So parts of the ocean are warmer than others, so that creates little boundaries that are out there. Um, sometimes the, the sun angle creates more intense heating, more moisture in various parts of the ocean. Um, you get effects from land. A lot of times, say, like a hurricane for us, typically start by the uh, Central, Central America, right? They are leftover thunderstorms that happen up over the high mountains that get blown out over the ocean. And as those storms move over the warm water, they say, ooh, I get some energy. So you already have some low pressure in the storms. And then they bubble up, and then you can spin it up. Okay? So it's, kind of, it's a mixture of a lot of different things. But the ocean, the air over the ocean is not completely homogeneous. We I mean, can kind of see it here, right? We can see that some areas are dry, right? Some are moist, more moist than others, right? Just based on the satellite. So there's a lot more change out there than may be apparent to the, the imagination. So. Are there general trends by latitude? Yes. Yeah, there are parts of the Earth where, based on the global circulations of the Earth, where the air sinks more predominantly or rises more predominantly. Okay. So this area here we call the intertropical convergence zone. It's an area of pronounced rising around the Earth. There's a strip that goes all around the Earth where you tend to get a lot of rising motion because as the air circulates around the globe, it rises and falls. So just to the north of that or south of that, you may get pronounced drying because the air is sinking. So the Sahara Desert in Africa, right? If you go over the Congo in Central Africa, it's a rainforest, thunderstorms, heavy rain almost all the time. They have a wet and dry season, but it's very active all the time. But if you go just north of there, dry as a bone, Sahara Desert, right? That's in an area of predominant sinking in the atmosphere, okay, versus rising. So there is some of that going on, and that shifts during the year. So you, can you see why weather forecasts are wrong every once in a while? Okay, it's a pretty chaotic system. There is some, there's consistency to it, but boy, it changes all the time, so pretty wild. This last map here I will end up with is showing you a forecast model. Now what these are are supercomputers take weather observational data and they plug them into all these equations that I learned in college and then mostly forgot. Okay, because I had to derive all these quasi-geostrophic vorticity equations and equations of well, motion knew, and all that. You knew they put it down. Yeah, and I, and I, it yeah I knew down the road that eventually I'd be working with a computer that would remember that, and I would just have to remember parts of it and how to interpret it. So the model takes all the data, plugs it into those equations, and then iterates it out over time to try to give us a forecast out for the next two weeks. Okay? There are several models that are global models, look at the whole globe, some are more localized. We have ones that run just for Hawaii or portions of Hawaii, run through the university and others. Okay? They zoom in, this is showing you pressure forecast near the surface, the precipitation amounts, okay? these blues and greens, and then these lines are wind direction at the surface. 
Right, so I talked about that high pressure to our north and the east, right? And you can see it here. Over time, that high strengthens and moves to the north and the east. And we'll go back to the beginning of the loop and also comes back in from the north. And we'll go back to the beginning. So here is our high right now. It moves to the north and strengthens and then slides off to the east. A cold front sneaks down to our north and stalls out and then high pressure builds back in from the west. So what this is really kind of showing is that our lighter trade winds right now will probably pick up. As we go in through next week, more moderate trade winds will come in as that high strengthens to our north, and then they'll kind of weaken again as that cold front moves in from the west. Okay, so that's kind of a general, that's what this model is showing us. Now we'll look at all the other models. A lot of them predict similar things, but the timings will be, will be a little bit different, okay, or how strong the system might be. Okay. So these are some of the various things that we do. When we make a forecast, we actually draw a picture of the forecast. And then we turn that forecast from the picture into words, put it on the internet in various places that you can get. Weather.gov slash Hawaii is our website. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG has been providing quality educational programs and services for over 40 years, serving students, teachers, parents, educators, and experts around the world and here in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, Improving Schools, Improving Education, CRDG. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.